Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, I'm going to give you a short explanation into how fluid is exchanged at the level of the capillaries. So with that, let's begin. So I'd like to start off by first giving you a short explanation on what hydrostatic pressure is. Because hydrostatic pressure is incredibly important for the determination of where fluid is going to flow in the capillaries. So in order to understand hydrostatic pressure, let's do a little demonstration. So let's just say we have a ball that is submerged in the ocean. Now let's just say that the pressure exerted on the ball is going to be equal at all points. So the ball is submerged at the bottom of the ocean and the water around the ball is exerting pressure on the ball. And let's just say the pressure is equal at all points. Now the pressure inside the ball is around 10 units and the pressure outside the ball is also 10 units. So what's going to happen to the size of the ball? Well, since the pressure outside is equal to the pressure inside, the ball would remain the same size. Now, what if we were to decrease the pressure outside the ball? Well, if you were to decrease the pressure outside the ball to 8 units, which is less than the pressure inside, the ball would expand. And that's because the pressure inside is greater than the pressure outside. Now, what if we were to increase the pressure outside to around 12 units? Well, since the pressure outside is greater than the pressure inside, the ball would collapse. So the hydrostatic pressure is the difference between the pressure inside the ball and the pressure outside the ball. And we can use this equation also for the capillaries, because in the capillary, we can replace the pressure inside the ball with the pressure inside the capillary and we can replace the pressure outside the ball with the pressure outside the capillary. So the hydrostatic pressure is the difference between the pressure inside the capillary and the outside of the capillary. So the second important pressure that is uh, important in determining where fluid is going to flow is the osmotic pressure. So in order to understand what osmotic pressure is, let's look at this demonstration. So here we have a beaker that is filled with water. And let's say that we put a semi-permeable barrier between the two compartments. So we have this semi-permeable barrier that is only um, permeable to water. So in other words, only water can pass through it. So let's take a look at how water is going to move across this barrier when we add solute to one side. So let's add solute to this side of the beaker. And when we add solute to this side of the beaker, we're going to examine which direction water is going to flow. So which direction do you think water is going to flow? Well, the answer would be it, water would flow from the area of low solute concentration to the area of high solute concentration. And what's going to happen as time goes on is that the water levels are going to change in this beaker. So the water level on this side of the beaker is going to decrease and the water level on this side of the beaker is going to increase because water moves from the direction of low solute concentration to the area of high solute concentration. So we can relate solute concentration to osmotic pressure. So this is the equation that is used to calculate osmotic pressure. And simply put, osmotic pressure is the pressure that would have to be applied in order to oppose the movement of water. And we can calculate osmotic pressure with this equation. So this symbol is the symbol for osmotic pressure. I is something called the Van't Hoff's factor. It simply states how many particles you ionize. So for example, if you were to take sodium chloride and put it in water, the Van't Hoff factor would be two because you get two particles um, for every uh, molecule of sodium chloride. And uh, whereas uh, the Van't Hoff factor for glucose would be one because that particle does not ionize in solution. Another one would be uh, m, so m is the second variable we see in this equation, and m represents the molarity, t represents the temperature, and r is a constant. Now, from this equation, we can see that the osmotic pressure is going to increase when we increase the concentration of solutes. So when you increase the number of particles in solution, you increase the osmotic pressure. So what follows from that is that water flows from an area of low osmotic pressure, which we see right here because there is no 
there is no particles in this solution. So it goes from an area of low osmotic pressure to an area of high osmotic pressure. Now, we can put these two different types of pressure together in order to determine how fluid is going to flow across the capillary. So this right here is called the Starling equation and it basically calculates the flux of water. So J is the symbol for flux and flux, simply put, is going to be the amount of water that passes through a certain area. So the next variable in the Starling equation is LP, or otherwise known as the hydraulic conductivity. It basically describes how well water can pass through the wall of the capillary. So in other words, if you were to increase the amount of gap junctions, if you were to increase the amount of fenestrae, if you were to increase the amount of aquaporins, this would increase the value of LP or the hydraulic conductivity and, there, and therefore allow more water to pass through. So in other words, LP or the hydraulic conductivity symbolizes how permeable the capillary uh, wall is to water. The next value is PC, which is the pressure inside the capillary. PISF is the pressure outside the capillary and the difference between these two is the hydrostatic pressure. Sigma is known as the reflection coefficient, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, so we'll just hold that. And these two values are the osmotic pressure. So this is the osmotic pressure inside the capillary, and this is the osmotic pressure outside the capillary. So when you bring in the values that you measure for each of these different variables, you can calculate uh, which direction water is going to flow. And in general, if flux is positive, this indicates that filtration is going to occur. So filtration means that water flows out of the capillary wall into the interstitial fluid. And when flux is negative, this means that water is going to be absorbed by the capillary. So in other words, water is going to flow from the ISF into the capillary. So what is this reflection coefficient? So in order to understand that, let's look at a demonstration. So let's just say we have this big particle, and this is the vessel wall. And what we see with this vessel wall is that we have two gap junctions. We have a small gap junction and a large one. So when the particle passes through the blood, it's going to hit this first gap junction. And what we see here is that the particle is way too big for this gap junction, so it cannot pass through easily. And then when it goes to the next gap junction, it still is too big for it. So in other words, this particle reflects off of the capillary wall. In other words, it cannot pass through the gap junctions. So what if we were to bring in a smaller particle? Well, when the smaller particle goes to the first gap junction, it's too big to pass through, so it reflects off of it. But when it goes to the second one, it passes through because it's small enough. So what if we were to bring in an even smaller particle? Well, this particle is so small that it can actually pass through the first gap junction. So if we were to compare all of these particles together, what you would see is that the largest particle is able to reflect best. So in other words, it has the highest reflection coefficient. So the reflection coefficient would increase from the smallest particle to the largest particle. So in other words, the reflection coefficient defines how well a solute is reflected off the capillary wall. And it's a scaling factor that goes from zero to one. Um, if sigma is zero, this would indicate that the solute um, is completely not reflective, so it can pass through the capillary wall rather easily. So these would tend to be small solutes. And a uh, reflection coefficient of one would indicate a solute that is completely reflective. So in other words, it cannot pass through the gap junctions, so therefore it just reflects right off the capillary wall, like what we saw with the blue particle here. And this will tend to be large proteins. So putting this all together, how does the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure and uh, fluid movement vary along the length of the capillary? Well, the hydrostatic pressure will tend to decrease along the length of the capillary. So what we see here is the capillary, and this is the ISF with all the cells outside of it. 
So the pressure at the beginning of the capillary will tend to be 35 millimeter of mercury, and the pressure at the end will tend to be around 15 millimeters of mercury. And what's going to happen is that the pressure outside the capillary, so the pressure of the ISF, is going to be constant, around negative 2 millimeters of mercury. So what we see is that the hydrostatic pressure is actually going to be positive along the length of the capillary because when you go at the beginning of the capillary you would take the difference between the pressure inside and the pressure outside and that would give you a hydrostatic pressure of around plus 37 and if you were to go to the end of the capillary the pressure would be plus 17 because you do 15 minus minus 2 and that would give plus 17. So what we see here is that the hydrostatic pressure decreases along the length of the capillary but it still remains positive. So how does the osmotic pressure vary? Well, the osmotic pressure inside the capillary tends to be constant at around 25 milliliters of mercury, and it tends to remain constant if we don't lose too much fluid or gain too much fluid between the arterial and venial end of the capillary. But the osmotic pressure outside the capillary tends to increase from 0.1 to 3, and this is because the venial end of the capillary is leakier to uh, um, proteins, so therefore proteins can escape from the capillary into the ISF, therefore increasing that osmotic pressure. Now putting these two ideas uh, together, how does this determine uh, um, how fluid is going to flow along the length of the capillary? So how does fluid move along the length of the capillary? So at the arterial end, what you can do is you can put in the values into the Starling equation. And when you do that, you would see that the flux is going to be around plus 12.1, so it's a positive value. So the flux is positive at the arterial end. And if you were to do the same at the venial end, when you plug in all the values, what you would get is a negative flux. So what does this tell us? Well, at the arterial end, since the flux is positive, this would cause filtration. And at the venial end, since the flux is negative, this would cause absorption. So we absorb fluid at the venial end, and we filter fluid at the arterial end. So in summary, we talked about what hydrostatic pressure was and what osmotic pressure are. We also talked about how we can calculate the osmotic pressure and how we can calculate the flux of fluid. We learned that a positive flux means filtration and a negative flux means absorption. And then lastly, we saw how filtration tends to occur at the arterial end of the capillary while absorption occurs at the venial end. So I hope this helped you understand how fluid moves in the capillary and I hope to see you next time. Good luck with your studies.